And welcome to Tomorrow Orbit 11.26. I'm Ben Credible, joined by a Sarah, a Space Mike, and we've got Carrie Ann out on the observation deck. Now, Space News, Sarah, what have you got? I've got Hayabusa 2. Hayabusa! Space Mike! <laughs> We got spacewalks and falcons and space force. Oh my, <laughs> it's going to be exciting. And on the observation deck, Carrie Ann, what have you got coming up? Well, I'm going to be interviewing the incredible Jeff from Death Wish Coffee, talking about how they went from being the strongest coffee in the world to the strongest coffee off world. All that and a whole lot more. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Now, before we start with space news, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone who makes these shows possible. These are our Escape Velocity citizens. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. You get a whole bunch of rewards, and you are the lifeblood of the show. These are the people who help make this go week after week. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. And as always, we like to start off with some launches, and we had a couple this week. So Space Mike, what, what was up first? Well, first off, we had two uh, kind of secret Chinese spacecraft that are testing some inner satellite communications and Earth observations, which launched on a long march to sea rocket on Wednesday of this week. As I said, this launch occurred on Wednesday, June 27th at 3.30 Coordinated Universal Time from the Zhicheng Space Center in southwestern China's uh, uh, Sichuan province. The two-stage launcher delivered the satellites into their intended orbit, according to Chinese officials. U.S. military tracking data said that they were in an orbit around 485 kilometers and tilted about 35 degrees to the equator. Now, Chinese state media released little information about the satellites. Uh, their names were not officially announced, and they only said that the twin spacecraft would conduct tests of inner satellite networking links and uh, Earth observation. But in any case, this was the 18th successful orbital launch for China so far this year. And uh, Whoa. the race is going strong. Yeah, that's a lot of launches. We're only halfway <laughs> through the year. Yeah, yeah. Right. Officially, we just hit the, uh, the summer solstice uh, over this past week, yes, right? Yes, so. we did. Yeah. All right, yeah. what else you got? We also had a SpaceX launch, a Falcon 9 launch, launching the next Dragon cargo capsule filled with supplies and experiments bound for the International Space Station. And coffee, that too. That just launched uh, early yesterday. <laughs> yes, and really, really strong coffee, Six, too. <laughs> five, four, three, two, one. Ignition, lift off. This launch occurred on Friday, June 29th at 9.42 Coordinated Universal Time from Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. And this was the last launch of a Block 4 Falcon 9, and so they did not attempt to do any sort of landing or recovery of the first stage booster. But this particular booster has flown before, launching NASA's test spacecraft back in April of this year, which actually makes this the fastest turnaround time yet for the launch of a recovered booster at two and a half months of refresh. But the Dragon capsule itself is a previously flown capsule, which first launched on the CRS-9 mission in July of 2016. This one is the CRS-15 mission. And for this mission, it's packed with a robot assistant for the International Space Station crew, pouches of extra strong coffee, as we said. And altogether, it's carrying 2,697 kilograms of equipment uh, uh, and supplies for the crew, as well as lots of experiments. Now, some of the equipment that's launched to the space station inside the Dragon's trunk include a spare Canadian-built uh, latching end effector, or hand, for the, the, the lab's uh, robotic arm. And plus, there's an instrument uh, developed by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory that's going to be mounted on the outside of the Kibo space station, or rather the Kibo module, which is going to be measuring temperatures of plants from space. And this experiment is called the Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer Experiment on Space Station, or ECOSTRESS. Whew, that's a backronym for sure. <laughs> but... <laughs> 
And I love that footage. That's probably I do my too. favorite I was just going to stop so you. Far. Look at how amazing that uh, is. That's just incredible. Yeah, I love that shot. But there was also an experiment aboard the Dragon capsule, which we've talked about, uh, which is going to be an artificial intelligent robot assistant, which is going to be helping out European Space Agency astronaut Alexander Gerst, who's already at the space station right now. And uh, with this, uh, it's known as Simon, short for Crew Interactive Mobile Companion. And it's going to uh, help complete tasks, conduct experiments, and help repair and upgrade components inside the space station. And uh, I think that that's a really cool experiment. But in any case, the Dragon capsule is going to stay at the space station until August 2nd after it rendezvous. And I believe it's a three-day rendezvous, so I believe it's going to be rendezvousing with the space station tomorrow on Sunday or early Monday. I'm not sure exactly. Um, but in any case, it's going to stay until August 2nd after its birth to the space station, and it will return a bunch of supplies to Earth uh, at that time. However, I do want to say that this was the 12th launch so far for SpaceX, and it just so happens to be the ninth flight of a flight-proven booster, which means that they've flown more flight-proven used boosters than they have brand new ones, which I think is just a really cool fact. Uh, but this was also the 18th orbital launch this year for the United States, keeping the tie between China and the United States right there. So, whew. 18th for the United States. And actually, so I got a couple comments from the chat room uh, based on some of this stuff. The first one is from Jazz Throat on that same number. If we look at the worldwide average, he says, if my count is right, we're on a nine successful or orbital launches per month average. So every month this year, if, if the count is correct, worldwide, that would be nine launches. How incredible is that? On, on average, yeah. On average, on <laughs> average, yeah. Well, it, it ebbs more. and flows, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. So, like, <laughs> I, I think in this calendar break, there are no launches slated for this next week. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there you go. Uh, now, you had also mentioned Summer's that... Summer's always slow, though. Summer's always slow for yeah. launches. Uh, you had mentioned like that was the last Block down. 4, but uh, Vogon asks in the chat room, I uh, thought they were using a Block 4 for the crew abort demo. I mean, I don't know if they are or not. I don't know what's going on with the crew abort demo, but in the live webcast itself, I mean, uh, um, uh, Mike said that this was the last Block 4 launch, so I'm just going off of what SpaceX said. Uh, and uh, the last comment from Neuropilot Pilot is, uh, CRS gave a pretty good show with a backlit early, mor early morning sun. Uh, you know, that dragon separation, oh, man. That was just like, you, you could, like the sun with dragon yeah. right there and the earth yeah. in the background just like moving away slowly. Oh, how incredible was that? I am a sucker for lens flare. <laughs> <laughs> that was a real lens flare, though. Absolutely. That no J.J. Abrams added, sitting on screen. <laughs> not added in post. Not added in post. <laughs> yeah, with little flashlights <laughs> off. His, dragon had a flashlight off to the side trying to... <laughs> oh, oh, all right. God. Thank you so much, Space Mike. Really great uh, information. All right, let's head it over to you. Hayabusa! Okay. All right. So this week on June 27th, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, their Hayabusa 2 achieved another mission milestone. They are in orbit around its target asteroid, Ryugu. All right, so Hayabusa 2 is a sample return mission to and from an asteroid, and it's in orbit 20 kilometers above the surface. And for the moment, all is well in Jaxaland. Okay. <laughs> Jaxaland. Jaxaland. I want to go to Jaxaland. <laughs> right? It sounds super fun. Okay. So, <laughs> the craft is everybody's favorite word, nominal. Uh, but Ryugu did have a surprise for the Hayabusa team. So the shape of the asteroid is a bit more complex than estimated. As Hayabusa approached Ryugu and the asteroid resolved into not the expected spheroid, but something resembling an uncut diamond. Kind of fitting for a C-type <laughs> carbonaceous asteroid, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Whoa, hey! <laughs> no, I'm here all week. No, I'm not. It's just today. Okay. <laughs> so the protruding angles of the asteroid mean that JAXA scientists have some complex computing ahead of them. So Hayabusa's mission is a multi-stage dance, and it includes putting a lander and three rovers on the surface, and blasting a new crater in the surface, and then having the mothership hover above the impact site and suction up samples. All this interaction with the asteroid means having a detailed map of the surface and a good idea of what to expect in the way of gravity. Well, Ryugu's facets make, uh, might mean funky gravity. Funky gravity. Funky gravity. Is that, is that the technical term? That is technical term. Highly I got technical. it from the uh, Google Translate of website. <laughs> 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 so more of that translation. Okay, so this is paraphrasing, but Jax's website did have something that said, 
What this means is the wider areas might have gravity that's not pulling down. So you, yeah. So you'd have uh, if you're sitting on one of those facets, you might be pulling. Might, oh, might not be. You might be you, pulling like down, sideways. Yeah, down yeah, might not okay. be directly at the core of the asteroid. Uh, and so they really need to do some mapping on this. Yeah. To get uh, to be able to make those landers stick. Mm-hmm. Because <laughs> they have. We've had issues with landers like not landing. Yes. <laughs> and bouncing a whole lot. Oh, poor oh, Rosetta. Go. Little yeah, filet. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Uh, that, they did some have some malfunction technically on that one. The the uh, the thing that the, the yeah, stakes the, the, into the, the ground. harpoons yeah, didn't yeah. fire and or at the right time, and so it kind of bounced off. But hopefully, the Hayabusa two team will have time to fully map the surface, get a really good idea, get a handle on the gravity. Sure. And despite this little curveball, the scientists were really excited. So excited that they gave their mission a whole new logo. Oh, yeah. And the colors represent some aspects of the folk tale that Ryugu is pulled from. I do not mm. know the specifics of it, but <laughs> apparently <laughs> All right, chat the purple room. is for royalty, Hel if you know. <laughs> All right, so purple for royalty, yeah, I guess, uh, if you, like, there's a pink in there. <laughs> and then the planetary colors. If you if you in the chat room happen to know, uh, yeah. let us know or in the comments. That would be awesome yes. too. I'd love to understand. I'm that. not sure what the connection is, but I do know that Ryugu. It's based off of the folk tale about uh, the dragon's palace, mm -hmm. and uh, the hero of this folk tale is taken on the back of a turtle, a gamera, and is taken down below the ocean to the dragon's palace, where he finds a uh, treasure trove of stuff that he brings back with him. And, they, and the reason they chose that is because Hayabusa is going to be taking those samples and bringing that back to Earth, aka taking the chest from the dragon's palace and bringing it back to Earth. So. Um, that's that's all I know of the folk tale. I don't know what the name of it is or anything like that. <laughs> no, but that's really cool. Yeah. I love that. Uh, I love the parallels there. That yeah. was really awesome. Uh, and actually, let me hand it back over to you, Space Mike. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm sorry. Before I, before I do, really quickly. Uh, yep, I will hand it back over to you, Space Mike. <laughs> uh, 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 we're following a yellow brick road of sorts here. <laughs> so yeah, since uh, um, in the two weeks since uh, I, I was reporting here last, so much stuff has been happening that I, it's been really hard to, to choose what to talk about. So I just wanted to kind of combine some of the things that have interested me the most over these past two weeks that I wanted to talk about. And first off, we got to talk about a spacewalk that happened at the International Space Station. So uh, on Thursday, uh, June 14th of this month, astronauts Drew Feistel and Ricky Arnold installed two new cameras on the front of the lab that will provide views of the commercial crew vehicles that are coming in during their final approach and docking. And the, the space walkers also replaced a faulty high-definition camera and closed a door that was jammed on an, an experiment that uh, uh, unfortunately failed. And altogether, the EVA lasted about six hours and 49 minutes. Um, the faulty in Instrument, uh, which uh, you can see Drew Feisel replacing there, is called the Cloud Aerosol Transport System, or CATS. It was an instrument which was designed to study the atmosphere using laser firing, and uh, the aperture door after the instrument failed was still open, so Feisel manually closed it and wire-tied it so it could be put in uh, aboard a SpaceX cargo ship for disposal. And the view that you're seeing right there is a new view of the one of the new cameras that they installed. So that's I love a lot. any of the yeah. new uh, HD cameras and beautiful views of that. So that also, one's, that one's really pretty. Gorgeous views. I love seeing the Earth from from like from there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Um, just a quick stat, uh, this was the fifth spacewalk for uh, Ricky Arnold and the ninth spacewalk for Feistel, who now ranks third in the world. He overtook Peggy Whitson's record. Uh, he has a record of 61 hours and 48 minutes now. So uh, uh, that was kind of cool that he uh, um, got that new record uh, during this spacewalk. Meanwhile, though, uh, let's move on to some other stuff. The uh, third meeting of the National Space Council happened, where they were planning on discussing the administration's third space policy directive, which calls for the establishment of new protocols and procedures to manage and monitor increasing numbers of satellites in low Earth orbit and the tens of thousands of pieces of space junk and debris that pose an increasing threat. However, uh, President Trump did sign the objective, but kind of hijacked the meeting uh, during one of his rambling rants <laughs> with this statement. Very Let's just importantly, go ahead and, uh, I'm hereby here. directing the Department of Defense and Pentagon to immediately begin the process necessary to establish a Space Force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. That's a big statement. 
There is no place like space. Good luck, General Dunford and the Joint Chiefs. I want to wish you a lot of luck with Space Force. So yeah, Space Force, woo! <sighs> I have a question. This isn't <laughs> official yet. This yeah. still requires an act of Congress, but I mean, he's directed them to try to, to form this. And there actually is a lot of pros and cons to be able to have an, an actual Space Force. I mean, uh, one of the pros to it would be to be able to protect all of the different military assets, be it spy satellites, communication satellites, uh, space assets that uh, control uh, different weapon systems that we have. And it would be nice to be able to congregate all of that into one in the office, not just from the, the assets from the Air Force, but from all the branches of the military. However, at the same time, the cost, the expense of organizing a new branch of the military while the Air Force is trying to restructure and streamline things is just going to be monumental. So, yeah, we'll see whether or not they'll uh, get congressional support in uh, creating this, but at least we know uh, that this is official now. So. Uh, we'll see what happens, whether or not we get a Space Force. One interesting thing, though, that I do want to want to remark on is that in that speech, Trump kept referencing Russia and China and their like anti-satellite capabilities and stuff like that. Something I do find interesting is that Russia is moving in the opposite direction. They created their own Space Force many years ago, and just recently they are refolding their Space Force back into the Ministry of Defense. So. <laughs> Uh, if this is in response to Russia having their own space force, then we're about 10 years too late. So, <laughs> uh, But the, the meanwhile... Uh, well, hang on. I'm going to pause you. Uh, pause you for a second. The, j just to reiterate, President Trump can't actually create a new branch of the armed forces on his own, right? I mean, th this there's a lot more checks and balances that have to occur before this is actually a real thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, he can direct the Joint Chiefs of Staffs to, to, to do that, but it has to have congressional approval, both the House and the Senate, and all the Joint Chiefs of Staff need to be able to agree on it. And I mean, there has, there's a lot of different um, uh, steps that this needs to go through to become an official um, new branch of the military. But, you know, there's a lot of analogs to when the Air Force was created, what, almost, uh, almost 70 years ago now? Um, there was a lot of people that did not want to take the Air Force away from the Army. They did not want to take those capabilities away. And it took a, a couple of years, but once that shift, you know, moved over, we can see what the benefits were of that. And, you know, the Army uh, created their own new Air Corps anyway, so that they would still have that capability. But I don't know. I think it could potentially good, be a good thing. This isn't going to be like Starship Troopers. We're not going to have, you know, actual soldiers in space and fighting those type of space battles. If there okay. are space battles, it'll be robotic. But, you mean, I mean yeah. Space, Mike. You mean it won't be space battles yeah. yet? <laughs> yeah. So this is like the request for proposal stage. Pretty much. Hmm. Pretty much. Interesting. Well, um, you know, I have a lot of questions <laughs> with regards to this. I know you need to move on, but uh, things like what happens to commercial uh, commercial space companies that launch from Air Force bases right now? Like, uh, do those Air mm -hmm. Force bases that are primarily launch sites for space do they convert it over to space bases? Uh, you know, and you know, the Air Force has been working especially the 45th Space Wing has been working like really hard to optimize for these like massive amount of commercial space flights, you know, with the new Space Force if they took over, like how would all of that impact? So, and I realize it's way too early to be asking those questions, but those are the things I think about uh, when we talk about, you know, moving from Air Force to Space Force. Not necessarily good or bad, it's just there's not enough information yet. All right, I'm sorry, I derailed you there. Right. You, had, you had one more part to your story. Kind of related to all of this, uh, one good thing uh, uh, that I did want to mention is that uh, SpaceX's Falcon Heavy flight back in February was enough for the Air Force to certify the vehicle to be able to start uh, launching military payloads, beginning uh, somewhere in, in the middle of 2020. And uh, they actually got a contract, a $130 million contract for a cas classified payload that will uh, launch sometime near the end of 2020. So that's really awesome. And I think that that's uh, cool that not only does SpaceX have their Falcon 9, but now Falcon and heavy uh, available to bid for uh, military payloads. Before then, though, uh, we can all look forward to the second launch of the Falcon Heavy, which is scheduled for November of this year, uh, carrying numerous different satellites for the, the U.S. Air Force, NASA, and a couple of different research institutions, too. So, yeah, just some cool news I wanted to share. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Space Mike. And uh, back over to you, Sarah, everyone's favorite word, Amuamua. Oh, yes. With Amuamua. the apostrophe at the beginning, With, for funsies. For funsies, <laughs> yep. 
All right, so everybody remembers the first visitor, first confirmed visitor from another stellar system. Yeah, it was an alien ship, as I remember right, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, cigar that's, shaped. Cigar shaped, like cigar -shaped you alien do. ship, that's yes. how, that's what it was. Well, turns out, you know, we might not be wrong. It might have <laughs> some thrusters on there. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so even though it is now well beyond the observation abilities of any of our telescopes, the astronomers tracked it as long as they could. And after crunching the numbers, a joint team from the I apologize, it's going to take a second. European Space Agency's Space Situational Awareness Near Earth Object Coordination Center <laughs> and the University of Hawaii. That's the E-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-
Maybe we'll catch one more. I've got a question from the chat room from okay. Destructor1701, right. who asks, is the strange chemical composition down to its being extrasolar, different ingredients? Ah, everything Ooh. is guesswork at this point. But one of, the, one of the project scientists said that it's possible that the lighter, lighter, more familiar gases were all lost to sublimation on its transit from its home star system. And all that's left is these heavier gases. Mm. And also, the smaller, lighter dust would have been uh, lost along the way as well. And so all that was left was the heavier dust grains. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so, so much. Sure. All right, we're going to take a quick wow. calendar break. And when we come back, we're going to be having an interview with Death Wish Coffee. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Look into a face that to my name. Uh, Space Mike is furiously working on his next story. Uh, now, uh, before we get into our interview, again, thank you to all of the Escape Velocity citizens who helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. <laughs> These are people who contributed $10 or more. We also have our Orbital citizens. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to this exact episode. They get a ton of rewards, and to find out what those are and how it helps the show, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, I'm gonna hand it off, or over to Carrie Ann, who will be interviewing the incredible Jeff with Death, Death Wish Coffee. It is kind of a mouthful, isn't it? It really is, yeah. <laughs> it really is. Uh, so as uh, Ben likes to say, I am Carrie Ann. Uh, typically Capcom, although Ben was taking over so beautifully for me today, and which means I get to be the commander. So I am the commander now, as they say. Uh, I have the incredible Jeff from, this is the funniest part to me, this is the incredible Jeff from the Fueled by Death cast, which is the podcast of Death Wish Coffee. I've never even heard Correct. of a coffee brand that has their own podcast. This is insanity. I need to know more. <laughs> okay, so as, as, a, as a coffee company, um, our founder and owner, Mike Brown, is really, really passionate about fueling your day and it's not just about when you wake up in the morning and grabbing that cup of coffee obviously that's our product that's what we want but we want to fuel your entire day we want to be your lifestyle brand we mm. want to be the clothes you wear and the entertainment that you consume so um i started out as our broadcasting manager to create a lot of that kind of content and one of those things is this podcast fueled by deathcast the idea behind it is it's a weekly show where we have a guest on every single week and uh, we ask, like, we basically have a conversation about what these people do, why they do it, and we ask the same question every week. What fuels you? Because we are all fueled by death. We are all fueled mm -hmm. by this idea that we want to leave this world a little different before we inevitably leave it for good. That Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's wonderful. So Death Wish Coffee is branded as being the strongest coffee on, in, in the world. And now Correct. you are uh, at least shortly going to be once uh, the Dragon Space Capsule uh, gets up to the International Space Station, soon to be the strongest coffee off world. How does that feel, yes. first of all? It's incredible. I mean, <laughs> this company, since its inception in 2012, has done some absolutely incredible things. And we are still a very small business. We just hired our uh, our 31st employee. So we're just a we're just a business of 31 employees. And um, since 2012, we've been lucky enough. We won the Intuit um, QuickBooks Small Business Big Game competition back in 2015, which got us a Super Bowl commercial in Super Bowl 50. We've also sponsored events for NASCAR and Poker Central. We were the official coffee of New York Comic Con last year. Awesome. And um, with us now on our way to the International Space Station to fuel the astronauts of Expedition 56. It's, it's a dream come true for all of us. It really is. 
That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's absolutely amazing. So for those of you who don't know my day job, I am a barista, I'm a barista supervisor. And uh, so I clearly have a love of coffee and a love of space. And uh, I really was starting to think I was kind of the only one until I started hearing a lot about you guys. Um, I love that you have this fueled by death sort of thing going on, but I have noticed, because I, I, of course, had to do some research and started watching a whole bunch of different episodes of your podcast, and you regularly have a, a science segment on your podcast, and oftentimes you're talking about space-related things, um, which is just awesome to me, but like, where did you get that passion to combine these two? Well, um Personally speaking, when I was coming up with the uh, with the show, as a, it started out as just an audio podcast, mm -hmm. and, and as I was coming up with the show, I wanted to have a couple segments to kind of ease you into the show before we actually got to the meat of it, which is the guest every week. And uh, one of those was always going to be science because I've been uh, enamored with science since I was a, a young boy. Uh, I used to, I, I mean, as a, as a very very young kid, I used to look up at the stars and the moon and just be so interested in space exploration and 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 just space space in general science fiction too huge science fiction nerd and um mm -hmm. i i wanted to incorporate that because i feel that that is something that everybody inherently likes even if they don't know that they do right? science is imagination imagination so is mm -hmm. science fiction mm -hmm. and i think that you know bringing that more out into the world is something that's that is something that's very passionate for me, and I think it, it instills passion in other people. And since then, our show now has split where um, the podcast is still in its same form where every week we talk to a guest, but now it's predominantly that. And then on, we have a companion show that's much more of a visual thing that we put out as an internet-based television show every week on Facebook Live and then also on YouTube, and that's where the science segment lives in that. Nice. I love that. And so it was actually really early on when you had the, the companion pieces you're talking about, the video podcast that you guys had on astronaut Nicole Stott. Yes. And yes. So when that I, was the precipice when I started of this. this I'll, I'll tell you, when yeah. I started this show, I, I put together a list of guests like white whales, like yeah. you know, the guests that you want to get. And at the top of that list was just written astronaut. I will always, <laughs> always, always wanted to talk to an astronaut. And I honestly just did a random search of a, like a Google search of just astronauts. And I just would type in random keywords because you type in astronaut, you get the Wikipedia page. Oh, sure, sure. Stuff. And I just was typing in different things. And I came across this website, The Artistic Astronaut, which is Nicole Stott. Nicole Stott mm -hmm. was part of the STS-128 and 129 mission. Um, and she was also part of the STS-133 mission. And that, and during the STS-128 uh, and 129 mission, she was the first astronaut ever to paint in space, hmm. which blew my mind. I would yeah. have thought somebody would have done that already. And um, that kind of got me thinking. And her website had a contact information. So I wrote her just a cold email. Hi, my name is Jeff Bears. I just started a podcast for this company you've probably <laughs> never heard of. Um, and I gave her the pitch for it. And I was like, if you'd love to be a guest, I'd love to talk to you thinking, you know, this will get deleted or right. go to her spam folder. And that's it. I got a response within a week. And awesome. she was like, I'd love to be on your show. And we got her on the show. And it was amazing because we not only had her um, do the guest portion, I also had her do the science segment of the, of the show at that time as well, because at that time, a spacewalk had just happened on the International Space Station, I, like the day or two before mm -hmm. we interviewed her. And I knew that she had performed one as well. So I wanted to kind of get her perspective on what it was like to, you know, put your spacesuit on, go out the airlock and be out there for hours. Mm -hmm. And the amount of focus, the amount of training that these astronauts do is is absolutely incredible. It, it really is. They are heroes for sure in every aspect of the word of what they do up there and and people and this is something that's lost on a lot of people people have been living and working in orbit on this planet or around this planet for the last two decades yeah and we never even think about it you know and and so we talked to her all about doing performing that spacewalk 
what it was like to, you know, look at the earth below her feet and, and do these different types of science experiments. And then I asked her, you know, like, what is it like when you come back in? You have to reacclimate, you have to, you know, get out of all your gear and, 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 you know, get back into being, you know, just a normal astronaut in, in this working environment in the International Space Station. And I was like, what, what is like the first thing that you want to do when you get back in? And she said, without hesitation, I want a strong cup of coffee. <laughs> so, you know, as on my show and I'm just, you know, uh, I'm having a great conversation with her. My, both my co-hosts and I just, you know, basically joked around with her. Like, what would it be like to get Death Wish coffee in space? And she was the one who was like, I think that's a great idea. I think people would really like it. Let's talk about it. Awesome. That's so awesome. I love that. So, so once you get this, so... Nicole, as my understanding, got you guys in touch with the food services, essentially, of NASA for the International Space Station down in Houston. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So, um, uh, again, after she had said that, you know, I figured ah, it was probably a joke. You know, like right. we, we, we were having a great conversation, a great rapport on the podcast. She was so nice, so welcoming. And, and I just was like, you know, we'll leave it at that. Throughout the last year, uh, we've become friends. I We email back and forth. Um, she was just a part of that incredible documentary series on National Geographic mm -hmm. called One Strange Rock. Um, I highly recommend to anybody if you haven't seen that. It's absolutely incredible. And uh, I was talking to her through like doing when she was doing that and the press tour and everything. And I would send her coffee from time to time. Never really being like, you know, when are we getting our coffee into space? You right, know, every now and again. We would like we would talk about you know her being back on the show or or whatever and it might come up but it was never like a priority and a couple months ago she contacted me and she was like you remember when we talked about getting your coffee in space i think i have a way to do that and i was like no okay this isn't real like what do you mean <laughs> well one of her good friends is serena onion chancellor who is part of expedition 56 on the international space station right now mm -hmm. and she is an avid coffee lover and Nicole is a fa such a fan of our coffee that she wanted to share her favorite coffee with her friend in space. Oh, I love it. So she was like, I think I can put you in contact with the NASA Food Labs, and hopefully they can help you get some of your coffee in a care package for her. And she got us in contact with the NASA Food Labs. And I have to say, here at Deathwish Coffee, we make a lot of products outside of coffee. We do apparel, we do mugs. We do, you know, all sorts of, of random things. So we work with a lot of vendors. Mm -hmm. The greatest vendor we've ever worked with is NASA. Uh, huh. Hands down, the nicest people, the best people there. Um, the people that we worked with were so awesome. Once we sent them the coffee that they did, they formed all their tests on it to make sure it was all right. And I'm thinking still to myself, this will never happen. Or even if it does, they'll, you know, to make Nicole and Serena happy, they'll put like a, maybe a bean in like her care package or something right, right, like, right, we right. did it for you um they ended up they ended up packaging and i actually have one right here they ended up packaging 60 it. packs of these uh, of these uh, single serve packs of death wish coffee and sent them up in the actual supplies not just the care package for serena they sent them up in the actual supply right. rations um for her and the rest of the crew up there and i i'm just over the moon this photo that you're showing right now yeah that i got to watch the launch live yesterday morning and that those colors that's real none of that's photoshopped none of that is is um you know manipulated in any ways the sunrise hit just as the separation happened and all those colors of the smoke happen. You want to call a dragon capsule a, dra a dra you know <laughs> a dragon capsule. That's a tail if I've ever seen one. And I was part of the NASA social event, um, awesome. covering the entire launch yesterday and the day before um, with forty amazing social media people and some people directly from NASA. And some of the people in the social event that have seen launches before and the guides in NASA who have seen upwards of 20 different launches have said they have never, ever seen a launch look like that. Awesome. That's so, oh, to be a part of history like that is yeah. just so incredible. Um, yeah. so, so specifically talking about the coffee and this entire process, like what was the most unexpected thing about the process of changing your coffee, which is typically, so like I, like I said, I'm a barista, I typically work with espresso coffee. We do have drip coffee on site where I am. Um, it's it's not Death Wish, but we'll, you and I can talk about that later. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, 
you have to change it. You can't just drink regular coffee in space. There's there's a whole other thing. I mean, you showed the single serving pack, which is clearly like a freeze dried kind of product that they have to add water to it. So how did you, I mean, because I would imagine that you don't just give them the coffee and they go through the process and you call it a day. Like were there testing? Was this tasting? Like what was the most unexpected part about this process? Well, the unexpected part was that it happened at all. But I'll tell you this, <laughs> this, is, this is where, I, I'm a big proponent of if you say something into the universe, mm -hmm. then it exists mm -hmm. and it has legs. And you know maybe that is as far as it goes. But if you say it into the universe, sometimes it becomes a thing. You know, like yeah. the greatest ideas. Uh, again, I'll go back to science fiction. You know, you look at you know your favorite science fiction like Asimov or or Rich or, or Clark mm -hmm. or even you know Star Trek. You know, people made these ideas, and now some of them are in reality we we hold in our hands every day. Um, and you know, we had thought about. Uh, different versions of coffee. We're always thinking about that. We sell a whole bean version, we sell a ground version, and we sell a K-cup version. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of this year, we're actually coming out with a cold brew variety, and awesome. we're coming out with an espresso, a Nespresso, um, you know, single serve type variety as well. But something that we have been researching and developing has been an instant version, a freeze dried version of coffee, because there's two major markets that you know enjoy that one being the outdoor enthusiast you know the camper the hiker the the person on the go um they love their instant coffee yep. but we learned um at, with this business that the asian culture specifically japan the coffee culture there is very much an instant coffee huh. so therefore um we were thinking you know well maybe we should at least pursue this idea to see if it would even be viable something to sell because then we could break into that market. Obviously, you know, like I said, we want to be everywhere. Yeah. Caffeinate the world is the, is, the, is the plan. And so we had had this in research and development for about a month, maybe a month and a half, and then Nicole got a hold of me with this idea. So it was just serendipity that we even were pursuing the thing that was the actual kind of coffee that was going to have to be brought into space anyways. So then we streamlined it. We made sure that we could get it done. The third party, because um, our facility isn't even set up to make an instant, instant coffee. So right, we, right. we found this third part. We found this third party company that's amazing that helped us develop the instant coffee to retain the flavor profile, the caffeine content mm -hmm. of Death Wish coffee, the way that we roast the coffee. And the greatest thing is, is this company has already worked with NASA developing freeze-dried products for them so oh, they knew God. the ropes and what needed to happen. So we already had a leg up going into it. Nice. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. That's that's so cool. So uh, did you did you get to taste any of it? Like, does it, does yeah. it still hold? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We tested it before we sent it okay, to good. NASA for sure. And I got to say, I am uh, grind your beans in the morning and use my French press. You know, that's that's yes. that's my my ritual. I love that that way of, of brewing, but um, and so I'm not usually an instant coffee drinker, mm -hmm. but I really was proud of this product because, like I said, I think it really retains the the flavor profile, it, the caffeine profile to to some degree. We are the world's strongest coffee when you grind our brain, our beans or you use the 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 ground version of our coffee. Mm -hmm. If you're freeze drying anything, you're you're taking some stuff out of it. So it's not as caffeinated, but it's still, it's a heck of a lot more caffeinated than the coffee that they have on the International Space Station right now. Totally, totally. Do you even know what that was, by the way? Like, do you have any clue? The, 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 the caffeine coffee? content, I don't. I'm actually, I'm, I'm going to be contacting NASA Labs again because I'm so interested on the results of the test that they did. I don't know if I'm allowed to know that, but I really do want to, <laughs> I, as a science nerd, I just, I would love to just, you know, see those numbers and see like what, what, what actually they were able to discern right? from our instant coffee. Oh, that's so awesome. Oh my gosh. Okay. So we have a whole bunch of questions coming in from the chat room. Um, some of which you may be able to answer and some of which you may not be able to answer. So, uh, I'll make up. Yeah. Ex perfect. 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 <laughs> uh, first of all, Prismara says, uh, how do you filter coffee in zero G? Uh, which I guess you, for this kind of thing, you wouldn't necessarily need to, right? Those are the single serving packs. Right. Yeah. So this pack again, um, basically all you have to do, there's this nozzle right here and the astronauts will take like a hot water um, valve, put it into the nozzle, hydrate the coffee, and it even has instructions, eight ounces of water, two to five minutes on it. And it kind of, you know, like an instant version, mm -hmm. you kind of push it around and everything. And then there's a straw attachment 
that they put on this and they drink it like a juice bag. Um, nice. But I believe it was 2015 or 2014. Mm -hmm. um, they they installed what they called the ISS Espresso. That uh, SpaceX's Dragon Space Capsule Station. also brought up. Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and uh, there was a there was a guy that actually created a zero G coffee cup mm -hmm. that through wicking, if you know what wicking is, they could they could actually drink you know a cup of coffee through wicking. I. I've seen video of it and it looks it looks cool, but it seems super dangerous, especially, <laughs> you know, like liquid, like floating around with a bunch of electronics and wires all over the place. Absolutely. But. Absolutely. Oh, I love it. That's hilarious. Uh, this is a really great question. Uh, again, I don't know if you'll be able to answer, but Space Danger says, why not just grow it on the ISS? So it's funny. I'm so glad that this question got asked. So. Just down at NASA on Thursday, mm -hmm. I asked the people at the Veggie Labs who are developing ways to grow crops in space. Mm -hmm. I had to ask. I was like, "So what is what's the timeline for coffee? Because right now they're working on growing kale, they're working on growing uh, dragon lettuce, mm -hmm. and um, they're actually working on setting up the first tomato plants in the next two years up it. to the International Space Station to grow to grow those." And they said that you know. The more that they're testing this, the more that they're working. Coffee is definitely something as a crop that they want to grow. It's just the matter of um, space and the matter of the, the apparatus, the veggie apparatus that they have. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as a side note on all this, I had uh, Dr. Michio Kaku on, the, on our podcast recently, mm -hmm. and we were talking about colonizing Mars. And I asked him specifically when we do colonize Mars and hopefully we start, you know, harvesting the water and therefore growing crops a la, you know, the blockbuster movie, The Martian or whatever um, <laughs> on, on Mars. What is the viability of growing coffee? And Michio Kaku told me straight up, he was like, you know, if we can get the biometrics and the greenhouses set up the way that people like him and Elon Musk are, are talking about doing when we do colonize, mm -hmm. coffee will be 100 percent able to be grown in that environment and uh the caffeine should hit us just about the same i love it i love oh actually yeah. that goes directly to uh this question that came off of uh youtube uh raj says does coffee affect the human body differently in a low or zero gravity environment uh that's actually something i have no idea do you have any clue about that jeff i i don't have any clue specifically about the caffeine i know i have been told from nasa food labs mm -hmm. and from astronauts like nicole stock that Caffeine still hits you like when they would drink when she would drink coffee after a spacewalk, mm -hmm. you know, she would feel that jolt of energy, but it's it's affecting you a little bit different because of your diet. It's not even just the zero G. Um, the diet of an astronaut is very high in protein and very high in sodium. Sure. So it, it and and you're also as as people know you're also you know shedding bone mass. Yes. You're shedding um, uh, lots of different chemicals and, and stuff like that. So caffeine is affecting you, but in a slightly different way. You might actually be more awake. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. God, that's funny. Uh, another question uh, coming off of our Twitch channel. Uh, Hanny says, uh, "Hey, do you ever think that?" you be able to indulge your science interest to the extent that you have while running the podcast, while running this company? I wish I was, first of all, I wish I was running the company. I do not <laughs> run the company. I just, I'm just the broadcasting manager. Um, I don't have to make all those crazy, you know, money decisions and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but um, no, never, like I said before, when I had my, my list of white whales for the show, I wrote astronaut up there thinking, nah, maybe someday. You know, mm -hmm. and not even just having an astronaut on the podcast to me was like best day ever kind of thing, you know. Right. And now being able to work closely with NASA, be consider an astronaut, my friend, yeah. um, have a, something that I had a hand in on its way to the International Space Station. I, I it still doesn't seem real. It, <laughs> I flew back from Florida today and I'm still processing everything that just happened with the with the launch and everything that I got to experience. And it, it just honest to gosh, it does not seem like it's even a real thing. But I'm just so, so happy that it is because, again, I'm so happy that science and especially space exploration is in the conversation again. Mm -hmm. And I want to say this real quick, uh, from throwing it back to the, the beginning of this show yeah. with the news segments. Um, politics aside, uh, with Trump saying, you know, Space Force, 
what I take away from something like that is at least we're talking about it. Yep. I, 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 I'm so, I'm so happy for people out there in the world like Michio Kaku, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, Elon Musk, even Jeff Bezos, these people who are, want to make sure that people are not only going to space, working in space, figuring out ways that we can, you know, travel through the solar system, but that people here on Earth are excited about it and want to talk about it. Totally. A thousand, a thousand percent. Um, all right. So we've got a couple of standard questions we typically end every uh, every uh, interview with. Although it's funny, now that I'm looking at them, I'm pretty sure we've covered most of them anyway. So uh, this will be relatively quick, I suppose. Uh, first question is, what is your favorite space mission? And I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing I already know the answer to this one. I mean, okay, the easy answer <laughs> is the one that just happened and brought uh, Deppish Coffee to the International Space Station. <laughs> Um, but I mean, that's a tough question for, you know, favorite space mission. Right. I mean, I could throw it all the way back to John Glenn. I think about John Glenn so much because the, the, he paved the way as a human being to prove that we could do what we do now. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, again, going to Kennedy Space Center just, just a couple of days ago and seeing the tight space that that man had to, <laughs> you know, squeeze himself into in his suit to orbit the Earth. And it, it just then skyrocketed, pun intended, the entire space program. You know, I think that's that's just incredible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazing. That's awesome. Uh, next question is, do you prefer human or robot exploration of the cosmos? Cosmos. Um, I, I honestly prefer, prefer human, mm -hmm. but if I'm going to be as science fiction nerd as I possibly can, we're going to need both. That's yeah. why I'm really excited about this Simon project that's going up. Um, thanks to the people at DL, DLS and, um, uh, IBM, we're bringing up this AI because I'm very curious to see how that's going to work, even though, and I know that, that these jokes have been made, but even though it's, it's very much, uh, HAL 9000 there, you know, quite, 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 um, right. space, like, space odyssey kind of, kind of craziness. But I, th I believe that like it, with the, with the ability to have artificial intelligence robots that can help humans perform tasks at a higher rate, mm -hmm. I think that will help us get farther into the cosmos, and that's the end goal. We need to be an interplanetary species for sure. Lovely, well, that leads directly into the next question, which is where should we go next? Mars, 100%, but before Mars, and I'm, I'm all for this as well, we need to have a presence on the moon. This whole deal of, of you know, figuring out how to get what we need into space from Earth and out of our atmosphere, we are at an impasse at this point with fossil fuel, with the ability to, you know, have it viable for human or robot interaction. Um, I really believe that we should be put, pouring resources and energy into having either a base on the moon or something that's orbiting the moon that allows us to then go from there to Mars and then hopefully all over the solar system. I love it. And then finally, why space? Why space? Yeah. Because it's there. <laughs> because it's there. The argument is always this. We, our, our, our planet is 75% water or 73% water or mm -hmm. whatever, and we know so little about the depths of the oceans, and we know so little about our own planet, and I agree with that. I think that we should you know, continue exploring our own planet, but again, we need to be an interplanetary species, especially if we plan on surviving for centuries and eons later. And I think that starts now. Space is out there. We have been making leaps and bounds since the 40s now, you know, in, in, like putting things into upper atmosphere and beyond. And now, you know, is the time to really start, again, getting that, the entire human consciousness behind it. So we start traveling the stars as soon as possible. Oh, I 
love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, as uh, Bonsai in the chat room says, his story is so good, I might start drinking coffee. Uh, the Incredible Jeff, uh, fueled by Death Cast, Death Wish Coffee. You clearly live up to the name. Thank you, sir. You and I could talk for hours on end and probably bore absolutely everybody. But uh, I, <laughs> I, I want to invite you back. If you ever get these super secret test results that you're not supposed to have, please, please, please uh, come back and we'll, we'll go over all of them with a microscope. This was absolutely incredible to talk to you guys today. And uh, I loved being on the show. I would love to come back. Thank you so much. Totally. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, we're going to take another little bit of a break. And when we come back, we're all going to be together discussing your questions, comments, concerns, and complaints about last week's show. Stay with us. There's more tomorrow up next. Science. It both draws us together and tears us apart. Brings discoveries to cure us and threaten us. It is neither good nor evil. It is what we decide to make of it. There is so much more to learn. And we are curious. Together, Let's explore the science of tomorrow. There Capcom we go. Capcom almost didn't make it. Uh, well, welcome. I was like, I'll have to fill in. That's fine. I'm the commander. I can do that. That, that was, if you could see what happened behind the scenes, it was all sorts of magical. So uh, before we get into comments from this last week's show, I did want to give a huge thank you to everyone who make this show possible. These are our Escape Velocity citizens. They've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We also have our Orbital citizens who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And of course, we also have our suborbital citizens who have contributed $2.50 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, now, um, in my running, I inadvertently uh, closed my rundown. So <laughs> last week what we had on, in case you need that extra help. I, I do. Thank you very much for that. The one I called Mr. Dr. Charles, Dr. Yes. Charles Liu, uh, on, from Orbit 11.25. Uh, he was fantastic and definitely put up with all of our shenanigans, as did the incredible Jeff. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, no, it was, that was a really great, really interesting um, um, interview. And it was really cool. If you didn't get a chance to see it, it was one of those magical moments where we had an item in the news where Charles was like, um, actually? No, yeah, he yeah, was like, yeah, yeah. he was waving his hands, <laughs> trying to get our attention. The yeah. whole show. Yeah, yep. it, mm -hmm. that, was, that was the best. Yeah, yeah. really, I, really I great. enjoyed that moment quite a bit where he was like, I can answer that. Yep. And so right. we just bounced right really? over to him and was like, oh, that's <laughs> then maybe amazing. maybe you should, because really you're cool. probably better at it than we are. Uh, yeah. All right, so thank you very much, Cafcom. Wow. Capcom. Get it? Wow. Caf caffeine. Wow. And again, Capcom. really quickly, for those of you who may not have been watching the entire time we've been on, uh, and I mean the 10 years, not just this particular show, uh, but those of you who have may recall that at one point, our coffee, our coffee, our show was in the back of a coffee shop. So oh, yes. coffee this... in space literally runs in our veins. Oh, yeah. We, we've done coffee with this show for years. We used to have... Um... Blast off blend. Yes. Remember, you could get blast off blend. I do yeah. remember. Um, all right, let's start off uh, with some uh, comments. This one comes from F Cycles from YouTube, who says, "Cannot agree more with Mr. Dr. Charles regarding <laughs> what we are good at. To have positive attitude, don't be shy to fail and take longer than any other. Then, then you can do anything you want. Also, th something you dislike, uh, something you dislike, be doing it. You may end up by being passionate. Uh, passionate, surprisingly. In other words, uh, do something that you don't like. You could inadvertently actually end up liking it. Yeah. Uh, then, when you have too many passions and are too busy, that's another thing. But that's a way cooler uh, thing in life than the opposite. So be positive. Um, you know. Do think even things that you think you may not like doing, yeah. do those, and you never know, you may actually end up liking the things in the long run. I couldn't agree more with uh, F Cycles. Anyway. It is, wow. it's a difficult yeah. thing to live up to. Though. It really, it, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to always go negative. Yeah. Right? It's so much easier to just be yeah. pessimistic and just like, oh, everything sucks, everything's awful, nothing is good. Uh, but, you know, those aren't the people who change the world. No. Uh, the people who are positive and who, you know, look at some of the problems and instead of saying, oh, hey, this is a huge negative, how do we fix this and mm -hmm. make it into a positive? Mm -hmm. They're the ones who change the world. Yeah. Those are the Elon Musks, the Jeff Bezos, the... Yeah. Uh, um, 
Dave Mastin's the you know so forth and so on. That's so that's the thing I always hate about the all those like oh there's an old saying it, because it always feels like well if it's old it's probably outdated and yet it, these things are not that is why they have stood the test of time. Yeah. So looking for the silver lining is so true and so necessary <laughs> most of the time. We do try to be an optimistic look at the future on the show as well. Yeah. I mean yeah. that's something that we try for. Yeah. It's hard. Although, you know, to be fair, uh, and no offense to Death Wish Coffee in any way, shape, or form, being fueled by death, uh, that, that honestly, that scares me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the morbid way of looking at it, but I get what they're saying. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, Depending on the whole idea of like we only have so much time, so I better make the most of it. Right? Quite. Yolo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yolo coffee. Yolo. <laughs> All right. Next up from Reddit is Cap MS MSFC Marshall Space Flight Center. Maybe. Uh, I am not dismissing the possibility that life on Mars could be indistinguishable. I'm making the case that it either is or isn't. And if it is, then no amount of decontamination procedures can assure that life is indigenous. Uh, by the way, this is in reference to a comment. This is, we're going inception here. This yep. is comment <laughs> on a comment. Um, the best way to search for life, in my opinion, is to accept this and use humans to dramatically ramp up our ability to do science on Mars. So basically the idea is, um, look, you can run all the decontamination procedures you want, ever. Yeah. You still will not actually be able to guarantee 100% that that life didn't come from Earth, right? Your, your, your rocket passed through our atmosphere. Maybe some spore of something got stuck on the backside of the rocket, and then when the spacecraft deployed, it transferred over there, and that's the life that you're detecting. Even though it all went through decontamination procedures, it's still absolutely possible. Uh, yes. Right, so the point is humans on Mars could actually potentially help that. I, I know you were passionate yes. against that, I believe. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, yes. I'll give you a platform here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and it, I mean, it felt like a slightly different angle last time. It felt like... Uh, it uh, could be. Yes. Yeah, so, this so was this one, the same commenter, by the way, yes. uh, and was clarifying their yes. point of view. Yes. Yeah, certainly. This one, I, and I was thinking about this last night. Uh, for me, this question feels more like, why aren't we just sending people to Mars? And for for the answer to that, it's we can't yet. I mean, mm. we could get a person to Mars. Mm. We just can't get them back. And you know, the reality of it right now, yes, totally. In the future, awesome. I, and this decontamination procedure is just so that the robot itself doesn't contaminate the planet. And it's, it's a best effort. because So this feels like it's two questions. One, why are we going to Mars? Why are we exploring? And two, why aren't we sending people? So I would say, we're exploring Mars to explore it, mm -hmm. right? We wanna, it's the same reason we go to the Amazon and try to make as little impact there as possible. It's not that we uh, can have no impact, but we wanna have as little impact as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so we are doing the same thing with Mars and our decontamination of robots, because why take a germ fest if you can just send an accidental germ? It's just in the long run gonna be better in case there is an ecosystem that lives on Mars and you want to damage it as little as possible. Sure. But then why aren't we sending people is because at this very moment, they, we can't bring them back. It is a death sentence at this moment. But the, with all the research that we're learning, with the robots that we've decontaminated, we're getting closer and closer to being able to send the people that we both, because I'm totally with you. I want to have people on Mars. I want to be one of the people on Mars. <laughs> but we can't, I want to be able to come back. Sure. And so that means sending decontaminated robots so that when we get to send people to Mars, we will have as pristine an environment as possible to do the faster scientist human on the planet uh, observations. Yeah. Yeah. And some of the comments <laughs> uh, for last week's show, not necessarily in this comment, were uh, like, if we're always looking for life on Mars and not willing to send anything until we find it and there's no life on Mars, we'll never send anyone to Mars. But to your point, it's not that we're waiting to find life or not find life. Right. It's that we can't send our uh, ourselves. Right. To, the only <laughs> thing we can send are these small... And Curiosity and MS, uh, 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 Mars 2020 oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, are large yeah. for what they are, but yeah. they're still not that big. Yeah. They're, and that's the yeah. biggest thing we can send. 
It is, yeah. Um, at the moment. At the moment. Right? At the moment. Because we're going to yep. send a big fracking rocket. <laughs> <laughs> falcon. Big falcon well, rocket. Sh yes. <laughs> well, somebody's yeah. going to send a big right. falcon rocket. Somebody else is going to send a big fracking right. rocket. <laughs> I got you. I got you. There, there's multiple space, right? You got big, fal big falcon rocket, um, Blue Origin space, Mike. What's the one after uh, it's... Um, uh, well, it's uh, probably Glenn named after the first Armstrong. human that's been on Mars. Oh, wait. Sorry, I'm, go I'm ahead. Sorry, space, Mike? Mm -hmm. After New Glenn, they're going to have New Armstrong. New Armstrong, yep, that makes so. Armstrong. New Armstrong would likely be in that same classification uh, of rocket. Do you know, Space Mike, is New Armstrong in a BFR SLS category? Uh, other than people at Blue Origin, nobody knows what, okay. the, what category it is. There's I'm, no specs that I've seen that I can trust anyway. <laughs> I'm um, going to however, pretend. I do want to bring up that both Boeing and Lockheed Martin um, at least have plans for Mars landers that would be able to return humans from the surface. Although their architecture would kind of be like the lunar one where like they would lift off from the surface and then rendezvous with their spacecraft in orbit and then return home. And so there are plans out there. They probably won't develop those unless they get the money. But there's there's a couple of Mars landers you know, in the works. This just in, I apologize. Uh, it seems our director knows exactly what the name <laughs> yes. is going to be. <laughs> 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 I can <laughs> see it in front of you. Go ahead and send it over. <laughs> it's a new, new Watney. <laughs> new Watney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, but my point is, you know, uh, we're, we're getting there, right? We've got SpaceX developing something. Uh, yeah. You know, Space Mike is mentioning uh, Boeing and Lockheed developing something. NASA's developing something. Blue Origins likely developing something. Uh, the new Watney. Um, <laughs> right. uh, you know, we, there's many, there many companies. Pattern, in case you haven't noticed it many, yet. Many, many companies working on this. So, and, and I think you're right. When the question is reframed that way, yeah. I, I think we're all kind of generally on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, lo lo would love the continuing conversation on that. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, moving right along from Bruce on YouTube. He says, "General comment: The world is metric. <laughs> USA is something else. Please standardize." <laughs> Are you global or are you American? Sorry, Lisa. I don't know why we're apologizing to Lisa. Uh, I mean, Lisa's, she's got Lisa's it right. like, Lisa's like. She's global and American, so I she, don't know just, why we're apologizing she, she's to like Lisa. An, 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 an American, American from the upside second. down is yeah, what she is. Uh, and, and your USA audience is, I'm convinced, <laughs> metric capable and use it in the studies, papers, engineering. So um, to that point, I don't know where we screwed up uh, Imperial Metric, but. It was probably me. I, I, I'm sure I said Miles. No, I mean, no, no, maybe. no. So, the thing is that sometimes when you do these news reports, right, yeah. the, the area that you get the information from may only present it in one fashion. And honestly, it's, a, it's just a human error to kind of glance over and go, ah, yes, that's Miles. I understand what that is. I don't do the conversion. I don't have to do the conversion. I don't feel a need to do the conversion. I apologize for not doing the conversion. You may or may not ever do that. And I, I feel like in general, that is an acceptable answer. Also, it's not like you said, I don't know, it's going for <laughs> you, you give some sort of unit of measurement, in which case, that can be extrapolated or translated into whatever other unit of measurement is the preferred way. Right. So to to your <laughs> to that question, um, we actually do have a standard on the show. Uh, we use uh, metric and coordinated time for everything. Uh, coordinated Earth time, as I like to say. <laughs> uh, uh, well, coordinated uh, Mars time is different, so you have to differentiate. <laughs> it, it is uh, 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 universal or uh, coordinated universal time. Um, is the official time metric for the show, which you see us tweet, and metric is the official measurement for the show. However, you need to understand that, as Carrie Ann said, um, we do live in the US, we did grow up with Imperial, that's what we see and use every day, for better or for worse. And so, sometimes Imperial is gonna slip in there, we might forget metric. Dude, just add it in the comments. <laughs> like, n I, I, I understand and appreciate that we are weird, and I also think that the US should move to metric, but we are going to screw up from time to time. We're an internet show. It's going to happen. So I apologize in advance. But yeah, yeah. Yes, metric is no. the official think, format of the show. I, I, I know I, did, I know where I did it last show. I put it in, when I was putting Terry Cruz's in, uh, <laughs> the, the screws you know, in space. But it's not. You're not. If you did do it last show, it's yeah. not just you. Like this. No. Imperial has made it into the show absolutely. many times because exactly what Carrie Ann said. It's yeah. so easy for yeah, us yeah, yeah. to respond to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you're not paying attention, you yeah. just you don't like. Especially as you're really quickly trying to do things in your last yeah. minute notes, you just boom. Imperial. But the nice thing is there are a number of areas, uh, a number of sources that will list both, which yeah. is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, Mike actually does a fantastic job of continuing to uh, to do the translation, uh, even if it's not uh, readily present in, uh, in the original news source. 
<laughs> Thank you. I, it's funny because I actually have kind of dropped the uh, Imperial lately because normally, yeah, I would be just like, and this was 257 kilometers or 300 and some miles. Yeah. Uh, but lately, I've just been dropping the miles. Just like, all right, let's just go with metric then. Yeah. That's cool with me. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah and, and you can yeah, add. It's nice. it's nice to have that for our American uh, um, audience, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it is what we grew up with. It's it's what we know. Uh, and approximately 50% of our viewers come from the U.S. So, you know, when 50% of your viewers have a hard time or, or don't natively think that way, yeah. um, you know, it's, it is nice to have both. But, again, the, the official show format is Imperial because... Because it is. <laughs> I mean, we had to choose one, and it doesn't make sense to make, it's like, do coordinated time and then... Um, Right. Well, we, we do countries. metric time. We do metric time. And me no, I'm just kidding. Wow. Right. Uh, next up, this is from. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I have to read this comment from Dutta. This is great. There's a saying in America, and this is a nice little translation here. Uh, <laughs> as someone suggested earlier, you give them 2.54 centimeters, they take a whole 1,609,324 1, <laughs> meters. <laughs> As the saying goes in America, you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious. Oh my God. That is easy. Oh. Uh, and as old Bill says, metric is easy, changing is not. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, and yeah. I know we've lingered on this way too long, and I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, but you know, what you, you, when you think and work in metric, it does take a little bit of time for you to understand, you know. Um, you know, one meter is about three feet. So I, I know about how long three feet is, but then I, because I, I don't work in that world all the time, I have to think, okay, well, one meter is actually about about like that or so, right? You, right. It you just takes translate. you a moment. You have to translate Yeah, it's another in language. It's First, another language. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly correct. Yeah. So just remember, everyone who's not in the U.S. watching this show, when we do metric, we are all translating. Yes. In, <laughs> like, we're trying to figure out what we're doing. All right. Next up from YouTube, this is uh, Stefan, I believe, or Steven? Stephen? Steven? 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 Uh, I said the trash segment, wrong attitude. Uh. <laughs> all caps, <laughs> wrong. Uh, a better attitude would be all new satellites need a deorbit system built in prior to launch. Also, anything in space that's no longer operational should be fair game. But I, I, I disagree. So you still need to have trash collection yeah. because even if you have a deorbit system, what if your satellite fails? What if it's out of control? What if, uh, if you know China launched an anti-satellite system? Mm -hmm. Your deorbit system's not going to work when the uh, government destroys your satellite. Yeah. yeah, now you've got all of this stuff in space. Um, yeah. You know, something comes off your spacecraft accidentally, uh, yeah. or your satellite, right? Like if photovoltaic falls off. Okay, that doesn't happen, but yeah. <laughs> Plus there's all the stuff that is already there. Yes. We, gotta, we, mm -hmm. yeah. we need to get to the clean slate before we can say, okay, everything uh, from here on out mm -hmm. is gonna have some deorbit system. There's gonna be accidents. It, it's okay. Don't they we have, should have deorbit? A way to deal and we're with still... It. Yeah. And we're still trying to figure it out, too, of what yeah. the, the best deorbit systems would be. That's why this mission is testing yeah. out all these different types. And I mean, depending on the satellite and which orbit it's in, it's going to need a different type of deorbit system. Like if you have something that's in low Earth orbit, one of those sails would be great, you know, to give you some drag so that it'll, it'll re-enter uh, faster. But if you're in something that's, you know, even in medium Earth orbit, but especially in geo, that's... I mean, yeah, sure, yeah. that would work over tens of thousands of years, but you know, if you need something to deorbit quickly, you know, you'd have to have a different system to that. So we're still trying to figure out <laughs> what the best deorbit systems would be. Uh, Introtron uh, from the chat room says, "What if you lose a bag of tools?" I wish we had that footage. And for those of you <laughs> who may not <laughs> know where this question is coming from, uh, a number of years ago, God, it's over seven now. Uh, there was a, a spacewalk going on on the International Space Station, and there was a bag of tools, and it just mm -hmm. became out of reach, and it eventually deorbited, but <laughs> that was a scary prospect at the time of it could hit things, it could, there, it was a whole bag of tools, so the tools could come out, they could start floating around, they could hit lots of things, those things could hit other things, like this could be a huge issue, uh, and they tracked it all the way down, and it, it, it sounds kind of funny now because nothing really happened, and they're like, oh, they lost a bag of tools, and man, <laughs> that sucks, I guess I'll have to 3D print some new ones, which at Get the time was not available. Um, <laughs> But but still, the the point is is still there. The point is still made that yeah, sure you can you can do whatever you want from now on. However, you still ha have all this legacy technology up there doing whatever it is that it's doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Truth happens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're an internet show. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was gonna ask 
Uh, I've lost it. All right. Uh, <laughs> next up from Reddit, uh, Locas asks this Locas clip. Locase. Lo Locas. Uh, this clip. So last week's show from 55 minutes and 50 seconds to about 59:40 is a formula for success in lo life. Uh, so that's from Mr. Dr. Charles. Referring to Dr. Charles. <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, it is born of hundreds of sometimes thousands of hours of honing's one craft. That This is amazing device uh, culminates in one amazing thought and, quote, design your own future, unquote. I, I absolutely love that, right? Go out and um, there's something, uh, I'm going to say this and it's funny because, you know, we're a show that talks about things, but... Don't just talk about things, go and do them. <laughs> so, it, to as, be fair, we talked about doing something and then we made a show yeah. so we can continue to talk about doing something. Yeah, when well, that was the point I was going to make is that, you know, one of the things we wanted to do was inspire everyone. We yeah. wanted to uh, find a better way to tell some of these stories. And so we worked on, at the time, Space Vidcast. We, you know, we, sh we did really cool things with shuttle launch coverage. You know, and we, we worked and we actually built things. But it doesn't have to be a video show. It can be mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. So, you know, as... as mentioned, you know, design your own future. And if you're passionate about space, you know, figure out what you want to do in space. And using comments from earlier, maybe there's something in that whole thing that you don't want to do, that you absolutely hate doing. Do it anyhow. Uh, you know, just work on it, and you, you might be pleasantly surprised in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. See, here's just a quick little uh, personal example. You know, um, doing, uh, coming on the show and even doing my own YouTube channel years ago, you know, I never thought that I would be involved in this sort of thing. And, and e even though I am really excited about a lot of these subjects, I've always thought to myself, man, I don't think I would actually like to work in a factory building mm. rockets or actually operating spacecraft. And then I started playing Kerbal Space Program, which <laughs> is like, oh, okay, I get a lot more of this stuff now. And I could, I could totally see myself just having a wonderful, enjoyable career operating spacecraft that would be amazing and something that I never thought that I would have liked or enjoyed because I'm just like oh it's too much math or whatever but you never know so yeah try what you think that you don't like because you never know what you will like yeah all right uh, I think that's our show this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. I'd also like to thank our ground support patrons for helping to make this show happen. These are people who have contrib contributed anywhere up to $2.49 for this specific episode. And once again, uh, if you want to find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. And of course, next week, I'm super excited. I will be conducting our interview with the Gateway Foundation. We've been talking about them for a little bit, or at least hinting about that for a little bit. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. This is an, a different way of looking at some space station stuff uh, up in orbit, so that should be pretty cool. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. We'll see you next week.